Now, Dr. Blodgett has had a long and varied life. Let's start off going way back a while. His grandfather was a union organizer for the international workers of the world. So his interest in international conflict goes way back and runs deep. He served in the Army as an intelligence officer analyst he was studying uh, Soviet military activity in Europe and Afghanistan. Then he went to UCLA down south, where he received a bachelor's degree in political science. Later, he went to grad school, got his PhD, ergo doctor, in history from CS Santa Barbara. Then, he taught 15 years, California State University, Channel Islands, offering classes in U.S. history, terrorism, the United States and the Middle East, and the Cold War. But after 15 years of teaching, Dr. Blodgett said, I need a bigger challenge in my life. So he accepted a job with the 349th Air Mobility Wing at Travis Air Force Base. His job? Wing historian. What is a wing historian, you may ask yourself, just like I did. A wing historian, the military learned a couple of lessons from the Vietnam War. One of the big lessons they learned is that it's not that effective to send these young men and women off to another country to fight and die when they have no idea where they're going off to the other country to fight and die. So they wisened up and they called on Dr. Blodgett. And with all his knowledge of international conflict, he could come in and explain to the airmen, especially in this case, the foundations, the basis, what was behind the conflicts in the South China Sea, Taiwan, Korea, and Ukraine. Please help me welcome Dr. Michael Blodgett. Well, thank you. Um, it, the music was wonderful, by the way, I have to say. Um, absolutely wonderful. And in many ways, very calming. I'm here to raise your blood pressure now. Uh, maybe we should have done me first and, and the music second. Um, but look, let me start this by telling you a story about how I became interested in, in Iran. And that was one night, 1980, I was 16 years old. Um, I, was, I was listening to the Dodger game. I know that's Satan's team up here, but I was listening to the Dodger game and Dusty Baker was at bat and Vin Scully was calling the game. And all of a sudden out of the blue, he says, ABC News is going to cut in with a special announcement. Now, ladies and gentlemen, they had never done that before, and they have not done that since. I mean, just, it hasn't happened. So th this really, I mean, kind of shocked me. And ABC News came on to say that a rescue mission had failed in Iran, because remember, Americans were being held hostage in Iran in 1980, and several American servicemen had been killed. That was all we knew at the time. We, we learned mo more later, but that was all we knew at the time. Um, so that really piqued my interest in the Iranian-American relationship. And um, I've studied it ever since. Um, now, one thing I will tell you, I, I do not speak Farsi. And that's a little bit of a problem because I'm, I'm stuck with, with working on um, documents and translation, and those are always problematic. Uh, when I was in the Army, they said I could go to Defense Language Institute. I said, great, I want Farsi. They sent me to learn German. Well, sometimes with the army, you just shrug your shoulders and go with it. Um, and then having taught me as a German linguist, they sent me to Fort Bragg in North Carolina. Uh, so now I arrive in North Carolina, and by the way, I speak English and German, and neither of those languages are spoken in North Carolina. Uh, it was a real shock to me. But be that as it may, I, I wanna talk a little bit tonight about Iran and the United States, the relationship uh, and we really need to start talking about Iran in terms of oil, because that was the British interest at the turn of the, 19th, uh, turn of the 20th century. 
So they had worked with a series of Iranian shahs um, to create a, a oil industry in the southern part of Iran. And again, this is all part of the British economy, the British empire. Um, and Britain was dependent on foreign oil. I mean, Britain, like Japan, for instance, has no oil of its own. Well, this is fine until World War II breaks out. Um, and in 1941-42, um, Britain was being badly defeated in North, North Africa. Uh, Erwin Rommel, was. Uh, lo it looked like he was going over run Egypt. The British would lose the Suez Canal. Uh, and the Syrian government and the Iraqi government defected to Germany. Now, Britain immediately moved to overthrow the Syrian and Iraqi governments, but the other government that was threatening to defect was the government of Reza Shah in Iran. And again, Iran is where Britain gets much of its oil at the time, so that could not happen, okay? So Reza Shah was overthrown, the Soviet Union occupied the northern part of the country, and Britain occupied the southern part of the country with some American support, okay? Minimal American support. Um, and they put Reza Shah's son, Mohammad Reza Shah Pahlavi, in power. Now, he's a young man. If I remember right, he's 17 when he comes to power. Uh, so he's really dependent on his advisors, most of whom are chosen by the British. Now, at the end of World War II, the problem then becomes, how do we contain the Soviet Union? And this is an American problem. Britain is not thinking in terms of this, but America is, the United States is. And that means that Harry Truman and Dwight Eisenhower are very much interested in creating um, some kind of a barrier to Soviet expansion in the South, in, as well as in the West and in the East. And this leads to, for instance, the Korean War, this leads to the Vietnam War, this leads to the creation of NATO, but also leads to a closer American relationship with Iran. We start to notice Iran, if you will, okay, which we hadn't in the past. Now, in 1953, Mosaddegh, uh, a man named Mosaddegh comes to power in Iran. Uh, he is elected by the Iranian people, and one of his goals is to nationalize British petroleum assets in Iran. Well, needless to say, you can imagine how Britain took that, okay? They wanted Mossadegh gone immediately. So, allegedly, and, and there's a lot of, of ifs, ands, or buts around this story, MI6 had put together a plan to overthrow uh, Mossadegh and return the Shah to power, uh, raise, raise Mohammed Pahlavi to power. Uh, but they didn't have any money. Now, Kermit Roosevelt, who was with the CIA at the time, showed up, and he was, a, um, I think, a, a grandson of, of Teddy Roosevelt, if I remember correctly. Uh, and he shows up with bundles of cash but no plan. So the British allowed the United States to find their, uh, fund their plan to overthrow Mossadegh, um, and it works, it succeeds, and let the Americans have the, the glory. Let them take the credit. Okay, so British petroleum is not nationalized at the time. It ultimately does become to be um, independently owned, uh, but it's not nationalized at the time. But again, from the American perspective, this is very much seen within the context of a Cold War struggle, that we are trying to contain the, the uh, Soviet Union and that Mossadegh was a, a Soviet ally, a communist. He was going to turn Iran into a Soviet um, puppet state, if you will. Okay, now look, so Reza Pahlavi um, is returned to power and he's now secure, he's also now an adult as we come into the 1960s. And one of the things that he does is he looks around Iran and he recognizes that this is actually a very backward country. Um, it, most of the land is owned by large landowners. You have lots of peasants who are barely making a living working for those large landowners. And you have a clerical, um, elite, if you will, who are supporting the large landowners. Well, he comes to a conclusion that, that that combination has to be broken up. Now, it wasn't so much true in the South where you had the oil industry and you had oil workers who were, were making good wages, but it was very much true in northern and, and central Iran. So he launches what comes to be called the White Revolution. And one of the things that he wants to do is he wants to turn Iran into a... a Society very much like that of the United States or Western Europe. And that means, for instance, women get the right to vote. That means women, for instance, can serve in the armed forces, even fly aircraft. That means 
women no longer have to wear their headscarves. Okay. Um, and women could go to school. Women could receive an education. Well, again, we would look at this and say that this is just absolutely magnificent. But remember, the other thing that happened was in order to fund this, he had to expand the Iranian economy, and that meant breaking up these large land ownings, landholders ownings, so that independent farmers could start producing to support Iran and also to support uh, uh, export crops. Well, okay, by doing this, what, what the Shah did was he, he angered two groups that had traditionally supported the Shah, the clerical establishment and the large landowners. Now, one of the senior members of the clerical establishment was a, a mullah named uh, Ruhollah Khomeini. And he got loud enough in his criticism of the Shah that the Shah ultimately threw him out of the country. He went first to Iraq, and then ultimately he went to uh, France. So he was thrown out of the country in 1968. But even, again, the, my point is that as early as 1968, we're starting to see this anti-Shah movement emerge. And by the way, as the anti-Shah movement emerges, the Shah decides to create the Savak, the secret police. And to be very blunt, they were one of the most brutal secret polices in the world. I mean, the KGB had nothing on Savak. They were not unwilling to use torture. They were not unwilling to kill their opponents. And again, common Iranians were, were even, even the ones who were benefiting from this, were deeply disturbed at the tactics of, of Savak and at the fact that the Shah was willing to work with them. Now, all of this might have been a, a, a purely Iranian issue, except for 1967 and 1968. Because in 1967, Israel felt threatened by its neighbors and attacked and in six days defeated the armies of Egypt, Jordan, and Syria. It was absolutely shocking. Uh, well, and even that might not have had a, a impact on global affairs had it not been for the fact that Britain was having very bad economic problems at this time. They were working on rebuilding their, their economy after their colonial empire had been given its freedom. Um, now, traditionally, the division of, of labor in the world was that the United States protected the Pacific, Britain protected the Indian Ocean and Persian Gulf, and then the Mediterranean and Atlantic were protected by the United States and Europe. But in 1968, Britain announced that it would no longer defend the Indian Ocean. Also in 1968, the United States became a net oil importer. All those cars on the road, all those factories burning oil, we became a net oil importer. Also in 1968, massive oil reserves were found in the Persian Gulf. So now the United States is starting to look at the Persian Gulf and think, okay, now this is going to be part of the global economy because Europe and the United States and Japan all need oil to run their economies, let alone their militaries. Um, but now it's undefended. Well, who's going to defend it? It's not going to be the United States. The American body politic in 1968, 69, 70, they wanted nothing to do with sending American children overseas. They wanted their kids in Vietnam back, okay? So the, the late Johnson and early Nixon administrations are, are wrapped up in this problem of how do we defend the Persian Gulf? Um, and this becomes even more apparent in 1974, because in 1973, Israel had gone to war with its neighbors, Syria and Egypt again, and the United States had supported Syria, uh, had supported uh, Israel in a very practical manner, okay? It had probably provided the tools that Israel needed to save itself. Uh, the Arab states were furious at that, absolutely furious, and what they did was they shut down oil production. Well, for a modern industrial state dependent on oil to run its cars, to run its factories, to run its power, that's a disaster. And you can see right here, this is the 73-74 oil shock. The price of oil, this price of gasoline, which is a good, a good uh, measure of how this affected Americans. The price of gasoline effectively doubled overnight. 
And remember that that affects everything we do because when we go to work, we drive, don't we? When we buy things, buy food, that bread, that's made from corn in the Midwest. That has to be trucked out to California. The vegetables, those have to be trucked in from the Central Valley or the Midwest. That meat that we're buying, again, ranches in Texas or the Midwest. So it wasn't just that the price of gas went up, it was the price of food went up and the price of all kinds of other goods. Um, and, but, but wages did not go up. And this came also at a time when the world e economy was changing. Um, from the 50s to about the late 60s, 1968 is the date econ economic historians tend to like to use. Um, the United States had dominated the world steel industry simply because the German and Japanese steel industries had been destroyed in World War II, and the British and, and the French steel industries were really recovering. They hadn't been destroyed, but they were, they were very much um, depressed as a result of World War II. By 1968, those industries had recovered, and now they were competing with American steel. Well, American steel had developed a lot of very bad habits. They had become very um, inefficient, if you will, because they were the only game in town in the 50s and 60s. But now they've got this European and Japanese competition, and this is true of automobile uh, builders, uh, shipbuilders, I mean, just across the board in heavy industry. So now American workers are being thrown out of heavy industry as it reorganizes and as it tries to meet the needs of this new um, global economy. So we're looking at what comes to be in, called in, in the 70s stagflation. Uh, inflation goes up, prices go up, but wages, wages stagnate because so many people were being thrown out of work. Uh, now, it, I, I, I guess many of you remember the gas lines of 73, 74, um, you know, which could stretch for a mile. I was living in Simi Valley at the time and riding my bike to school, and it was exactly one mile from my, my home to the local middle school, where, junior high where I was at that time. And I will tell you, there were days when that lines for the gas station stretched that entire mile um, to my, my junior high. And there were other days when the places were just to have gas. I mean, even if you had wanted it, they couldn't sell it to you. Okay. So the, richer, the Nixon administration was aghast because they looked at this, and again, they're looking at this in terms of global politics and contain the Soviet Union, and they were saying to themselves, this is fine. Once the Arab states turn the taps back on, we're hoping that this will change. But what if the Soviet Union sends its armies south, occupies Iran, occupies Iraq and Saudi Arabia, and then they simply shut off the gas until we concede to them whatever they, they choose? I mean, this is the, the disaster that the Nixon administration is looking at. All right, great. That means that we need to do now, make a decision about who is going to defend in a very practical way, the Persian Gulf. And again, it's not going to be the United States, just not going to be the United States. Americans were not in the mood to have their children sent overseas again. So who is it? You need a country that's fairly modern because you've got to have a fairly well-educated base to, to operate modern weaponry. You've got to have a fairly large population if you are going to have uh, a, a, an armed force that can fight off the Soviet Union, at least until American forces get there. Um, so who's it going to be? And the answer was Iran. We've got a good working relationship with Iran, with the Shah. He remembers that we put him back in power in 1953. He has a large population. He has a population that's steadily gaining in education as a result of the White Revolution. From the Nixon administration, the Ford administration, the Carter administration, they looked at this and said, this is going to be our ally. So we need to get him the tools that he needs to defend the Persian Gulf. And that included, for instance, American and British tanks, the most modern tanks in the world at the time. That included American attack and transport helicopters, American warships that were sold to Iran. But it also included the F-14 fighter. The F-14 fighter was essentially the most advanced fighter of the world at the time. It was originally built for the United States Navy, and the purpose was that it would go out uh, far out from the carrier, and it had a very long-range missile, 
um, that could shoot down Soviet aircraft before they, they could get into position to um, launch their missiles with American aircraft carriers. I mean, the AIM-6 missile that the F-14 carried um, had a range of about 100 miles. And it had the computing power to identify up to a dozen targets and track two of them simultaneously. Doesn't sound like much at the time, but remember, this is 72 and 73 when this aircraft is coming online. We sold 72 of them to the Iranians. Of the first 144, every other one was coming off the assembly line and going to not the United States Navy, but Iran. I mean, that tells you how important this Iranian relationship was to the United States. But remember, if you're gonna have Iranians maintaining American tanks and helicopters, those are complex weapon systems. If they're gonna maintain the F-14 with its rate, complex radar, with its complex weaponry, uh, that's all very complex. Okay, that demands a lot of very complex, very well-educated, very highly trained workers. And even in the 70s, Iran just didn't have enough of those workers to fill the slots they needed. So how did we deal with that? Contractors. Thousands, tens of thousands of American and European contractors entered Iran in the early to mid 70s to maintain weaponry, to teach the Iranians how to maintain weaponry, to train them how to use weaponry. I mean, it was just staggering, okay? They brought with them Western values. Okay, now think about this. From the uh, clerical stance, from the, the, the stance of the clerical elite, these Western values are very much inimical to capital, to uh, Islam. Um, and they're very offended at the fact that all these American and European uh, technicians are here. And that doesn't count the technicians who were involved in the oil industry, because by this time, the British Petroleum had given up its oil st uh, shares in, in Iran. So Iran was essentially dependent on British and American uh, technicians to help them come up to speed in terms of uh, pumping oil, but also in terms of maintaining the system. So there were a lot of, uh, of Iranians who were very angry about this influx of what they saw as aliens. I mean, not just foreigners, but people who had just vastly different values from what they had. So. That ultimately leads to the Iranian Revolution. And again, it's not a, a leads to B leads to C so much as there are all these, these stresses out there. And then in 1978, I guess it was, um, Iranian workers in the oil fields of the South strike because their wages were too low. Well, first of all, that led to the next spike. So gas, oil prices went up, gas prices went up. Gas prices essentially doubled from their 1974 um, prices. Uh, so gas prices have doubled and doubled again within about five years. And again, that has a terrible impact on the United States and Western Europe, no question about it. Um, but in terms of Iran, there are all these various groups out there. Some of them want the Shah to go because they want a more democratic society. Some of them want him to go because he had disrupted the old um, agricultural system with the large, that was run by the large landowners. And there were the mullahs who wanted him to go because they felt he was making Iran a Western society and that was unacceptable. Um, so the Shah is finally forced out. He finally comes to a conclusion that Savak can't control this. He, no matter how much violence it uses, it can't control this. And the army is not gonna support him. Because think about it, the army is made up of the children of the very people who are, 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 are rioting. Uh, they're not gonna fire on their, their parents, their brothers and sisters. So he leaves the country and Ruhollah Khomeini comes back from, from France. Now the question is what's going to happen in Iran over the next few months? Ideally what the United States government wanted was to have a secular government emerge that we could negotiate a new relationship with. That's what the, the Carter administration wanted. The problem was CIA had no assets in Iran. They had depended on Savak for all their information. So they, they didn't know the players effectively. And they, they, they didn't know anything about Ruhollah Khomeini because Savak was not telling them anything about Ruhollah Khomeini, okay? They did not want the, the Americans to know that there was this potential challenger to the Shah. 
So the United States is, is, is basically blind in Iran in 1977, 78, and 79. And then, of course, the American embassy is seized. Now, the question has always been, who did this? Um, and the answer at the time was Iranian students. Well, okay, um, but who, who did they answer to anybody? And if so, who? The, the Iranian government disowned them but refused to move against them. Ruhollah Khomeini never told them to back down. Now, what was the relationship between the students and Khomeini? Again, we don't have a good handle on that even to this very day. Okay, whatever communications was going on between them, those were going on uh, by word of mouth. I mean, it just wasn't recorded. All right, so this crisis just drags on and on and on. Okay, it wound up over a year. Um, and for the Carter administration, now remember, we're going into the, uh, the 79, 80 election cycle, and the Carter administration is looking at re-election. So you've already got stagflation as a result of the, the changes in the global economy and the oil crisis of 73 and 78. Uh, and Jimmy Carter doesn't seem to have been able to control those. Uh, at least the, that was the perception of Americans. True or not doesn't matter. Uh, and now he's got this crisis they can't seem to control. Now he was trying to negotiate. The problem was nobody knew who to negotiate with. We'd negotiate with the Iranian government, and they'd say, we don't control the students. But we couldn't tell, contact the students. There was, there was no point of contact that we could go to to say, what do you want? And nobody was talking to Khomeini. I mean, he wasn't going to talk to anybody from the United States. So we're kind of in, in, in a, a, a very bad place in terms of working this problem out. And remember that we're still working under the assumption that in a Soviet invasion of Iran, they can use, they can, they can occupy the Persian Gulf, cut off oil to the Western Europe, the United States, and Japan, and essentially destroy the Western world. So there are all these things that are working at, um, in the Iran, in, in the Carter administration, that they need to feel they need to do something about. Well, then the Iran Iraq war breaks out. Iraq invades Iran. The Iraqi hopes were that they would break the Iranian army in a couple of days. Uh, that didn't happen. The Iranian army actually fought back very well and the war became a, a extended war. In fact, it would go on until, if I remember right, 1988. So now you've got, in 1980, an Iraqi invasion of Iran. Now here's the catch. The Iranian army was being ground down. Um, again, all of their equipment was American or British. And the problem was they couldn't get replacements and they couldn't get spare parts. So the Iranian army was doing a very good job of fighting off the Iraqis, but they were running out of spares, they were running out of equipment, um, and that meant somebody had to take over the fighting from the Iranian army, and that meant the emergence of the uh, Islamic Republic Guard Corps, the IRGC. And the Islamic Republic Guard Corps answered to the mullahs. They did not answer to the government of Iran. Okay, So it's a private army being uh, financed essentially by the mullahs of Iran. So the United States finally decides that it is not going to get out of the situation diplomatically. We don't know who to talk to. Um, and in fact, in many ways, no one seems to be willing to talk to us about this. So they launch a, a, a rescue mission, and that's the one I started this, this discussion with. Um, it was an audacious attempt. Uh, they were going to ferry Delta Force, the American anti-terrorism organization at the time, they were going to ferry Delta into Iran with eight CH-53 helicopters. For those of you who have never been in a CH-53, they are huge. Okay. Then the assault team was going to wait in a warehouse outside of Tehran overnight, or during the day, let me rephrase that, while the CH-53s flew to a hide spot in northeastern Iran. How in the world they were going to hide eight CH-53s is beyond me. I mean, it's just staggering. The next night, 
they were going to assault the embassy, bring the hostages over to a, a soccer stadium across the field. The CH-53s were going to come to the stadium, pick up the assault force of the hostages, and fly them to an airfield south of Tehran. And the American Rangers would have been dropped to seize the airfield uh, south of Tehran, Mansouria Airfield, if I remember correctly. Now, there, everybody was going to get on C-141s, they were going to torch the CH-53s and fly out of the country. Just an audacious plan. And it fell apart when a, a CH-53 ran into a fuel-laden C-130, exploded, and the, the entire operation collapsed. Now, I have always wondered, remember that those F-14s with their AIM-6 missiles, capable of shooting down an aircraft at 100 miles? If you're flying a Cup 3, 2, 3 C-141s out of the country, filled with hostages and hostage rescuers, those are nothing but targets for the AIM-6. I mean, they don't carry uh, the kinds of anti-missile defenses that a jet fighter or a bomber would. And I've always wondered, how did the United States um, intend to neutralize the Iranian Air Force? I mean, they had to do it to get those people out of there. Now, I have never seen anything about that, but they had to have done something. Uh, but the operation failed, and ultimately the hostages were, re were returned shortly after, in fact, I think the day of Ronald Reagan's uh, inauguration. But there's a Shia population, and the Iranians are, are primarily Shia Muslims, there's a, a Shia population in Lebanon, and in 1982, the PLO had, had been driven out of, out of Jordan in 67. They'd gone into Lebanon, and they were using Lebanon as a base to attack Israel, southern Lebanon. So in 1982, the Israelis had enough. They went into southern Lebanon to, to, to destroy the, the Palestinian uh, camps there. Um, and as, they went as far north as Beirut. Now, that put them in, in a clash with Syrian forces, because Syria was policing Lebanon at the time. But there's a, a Shia population in the Beka Valley, in the eastern part of Lebanon. And all of a sudden, Iranian uh, IRGC, Iranian Republican Guard Corps members, start showing up in, in the Beka Valley. And they've got weapons with them. And they start training militias in the Beka Valley. And they start paying for these militias. And by the way, the other thing they would do is if you were a Lebanese who lost your job and you were in the Beka Valley, the IRGC would show up with, with groceries. They'd pay your rent. I mean, it was, they, it was a, a very, very, very profound um, operation to gain the goodwill of the people of the Beka Valley, the Shia of the Beka Valley. So this becomes a, an Iranian stronghold in Lebanon. And it's soon after that that, that Americans and later Brits start disappearing off the streets of Beirut. And there were American professors at the uh, American University in Beirut who suddenly started disappearing. Um, now, they were apparently in the uh, possession of the, uh, of the IRGC in the Beka Valley. And we'll come back to that when we talk about this. Because in 1982, the Reagan administration was in exactly the same position as the Nixon, Ford, and Carter administrations had been. How do we defend the Persian Gulf? Okay, well, a relationship with Iran is out as far as Ronald Reagan was concerned. So his defense secretary, Caspar Weinberger, and his secretary of state, George Shultz, went to him and said this. Look, Iraq is at war with Iran. Like Iran, Iraq has a large population and a well-educated population. So let's do this. We're going to embargo weapons to Iran, but we're going to look the other way as European countries sell arms to Iraq. It's called the, the shit, lean to Iraq. Sometimes you'll see it called the shift to Iraq. The idea is that we can work with Saddam Hussein to, and he will become the American enforcer in the Middle East. He will replace Iran in that position. Um, and in fact, I'll tell you how close this, this uh, relationship got. The United States was giving satellite imagery to Iraq uh, uh, on uh, Iranian offensives to show them where the Iranians were going to attack. Uh, that, that data was extraordinarily classified. 
I mean, very few people in the American government got to hold that data. And yet we were giving it to the Iraqis, at least certain Iraqis. So you had this situation where there has been the, the, this formal shift to Iraq. All right, now, Bill Casey. Bill Casey is the director of Central Intelligence under Ronald Reagan. And Bill Casey firmly believed that the Soviets were coming. Not next year, not a year, two, two years, not five years, they're coming now. Absolutely, he was convinced. Uh, he, he gave a speech in, in a Chicago to a, a business group, and he made this exact claim. They, they, I've actually seen the transcript up at the Reagan Library. He's just adamant that the, the Soviets are coming, and they're coming now. So we have to be prepared to fight them now. Now, Bill uh, was convinced, DCI Casey was convinced, that we had to reopen the relationship with Iran. One way or the other, we had to reopen that relationship with Iran. And the guy who was with him on this was Richard Secord. Richard Secord was an ex-Air Force uh, general who had actually created the Iranian Air Force. Uh, so he knew the Iranian Air Force uh, backwards and forwards. And he was convinced that if we could reestablish relations with Iran, he could recreate the Iranian Air Force that could fight the Soviets. Well. Casey took this proposition to uh, President Reagan at a uh, cabinet meeting, and Weinberger and the Secretary of State convinced Ronald Reagan that this is idiotic. We can't do it. There's nobody in Iran to, to, to negotiate with. I mean, they all hate us. There are no moderates in Iran, Weinberger said, point blank. So in his, in his um, memoirs, Weinberger says, I walked out of that meeting thinking we had thrown the, the baby out with the bathwater. Meaning that this idea that we were going to support Iraq, Iran, out of, out of the... Bill Casey was not going to give up, though. So, yeah. The Israelis had, and, and Israel was, as long as I, I, Iraq and Iran were fighting each other, and that was great for Israel. So they were, arm, they were actually sending some arms to Iran, not enough for them to uh, win the war, but just enough to keep the war going. Um, and when Bill Casey heard about this, he decided that we needed to tap into this. So he made an arrangement with the Iranians. The Iranians wanted um, tow anti-tank missiles, and they wanted Hawk anti-aircraft missiles. And Bill Casey made the agreement that we would provide those and the Iranians would pay. Okay, now wait a minute. There's nothing illegal about that. Okay. Now bear in mind that this, the problem was the proceeds from that, those sales were then used to fund the uh, Nicaraguan Contras, and that was illegal based on the Bolden Amendment of 1983. Okay, that's where the illegality comes in. Secret diplomacy is not illegal. Okay, but the question was, how do I sell this to Ronald Reagan when... Weinberger and Schultz have already tried, have already convinced them not to. So why, what, he, what Bill Casey says is that we will trade these weapons for hostages held in Iran, uh, in the Bekaa Valley, I'm sorry. Apparently, in some way, shape, or form, Ronald Reagan okayed this. Now, he may not have. That's the problem. There's no paperwork in the White House from this period. Okay, so Bill Casey may have been running this entire operation entirely under, in the black, entirely without administration knowledge. And he was running it with Bill uh, Oliver North. Oliver North was the guy who was doing all the running. Now Oliver North is an interesting problem because he was a guy who had made captain as a Marine Corps officer in 1970, and in 1982 still hadn't made major. That was, that, in the upper out policy, he was going to be out in pretty soon. And then in 1982, uh, he ran through the streets of uh, Alexandria, Virginia, where he lived, firing a pistol in the air, shouting, the communists are coming, the communists are coming. So the local police picked him up, they turned him over to the Marine Corps, and the Marine Corps was going to get rid of him. Okay, they were going to discharge him. Um, and then all of a sudden, he gets appointed to the National Security Council. Then he's promoted to major. Then he's promoted to lieutenant colonel. Two years he goes from captain to lieutenant colonel. 
ladies and gentlemen, someone was pulling the strings on that one. And I, I have always felt, and again, I can't prove it, there's no paperwork, I've always felt it was Bill Casey. But the other thing, Oliver North had a secretary. Her mother had been on the national security staff and she had gone out to Los Angeles to be a lingerie model. Um, she failed. How you fail at standing around in your underwear is beyond me, but she did, okay? So she went to the, uh, her mother at, looking for a job and she came to the attention of Bill Casey and that is her over there. And suddenly I'm drawing a blank on her name. Uh, Fawn Hall, thank you, Fawn Hall, yes. Um, so out of the blue, Fawn Hall gets hired, her security clearance is expedited, and she becomes Oliver North's secretary. Anybody think there might have been an attraction there? Yeah. And then there were, there were claims that they were having an affair. Now in his, his autobiography, Oliver North says, we, we were not having a physical affair. But Fawn Hall, when Iran-Contra broke, she actually took documents about Iran-Contra, put them in her underwear, and smuggled them out of the, the uh, Pentagon. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a felony that could have put her in prison. That tells me that there was something going on there other than just, you know, buying coffee in the afternoons. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm convinced that Bill Casey is, is running this operation completely black, and he's using Oliver North to do it, and the, the, the hold he's got on Oliver North is that, okay, you don't do what I do, you get sent back to the Marine Corps, which is looking to discharge you, and you lose your former lingerie model secretary. I mean, those are very powerful kinds of things. <laughs> well, needless to say, in October of 1985, 86, I'm sorry, um, a Lebanese newspaper that was funded by the IRGC announced that the United States was covertly selling arms to Iran. Oh. Ouch. Congress got a hold of that and they started asking the questions like, what was going on, who was in charge of this operation, and where was the money going on? Going? And that's when they discovered the money was being shipped to uh, the, the Contras, and that, that created a, a series of investigations. Now, in January of 1987, think about this from the Iraqi point of view. You're, America is supposedly supporting you, and yet you find out that they're secretly selling arms to Iran. Now, Saddam Hussein had a kind of a prickly personality, and I think he took that very bad because uh, in January of 1987, the USS Stark was uh, on a mission in the northern part of the Gulf of uh, Persian Gulf, near, near uh, the Iraq-Iran border. And an Iraqi F-1, uh, a French um, aircraft, fired an Exocet missile at it. The missile, now the Stark didn't think it was going to be attacked, so it didn't have, you know, everything that, it, all its defenses up. So when this missile hit, it damn near sank the ship. And in fact, um, the, the admiral in charge, in, in command of the Persian Gulf, actually gave the captain the, the option of abandoning the ship. He refused and he saved the ship, but he lost several sailors. Well, the Iraqis later said, you know, we're sorry, we're mist we mistook it for an Iranian ship. I don't think so. I think that this was the first blow in the first Gulf War. I think that this was Saddam Hussein saying, I'm angry at you for this covert, op this covert opening to Iran. Well, that also led Iran to start mining the Persian Gulf. And the, the thought is that, look, you've got these big oil tankers that have to go into Kuwait and Saudi Arabia to, to fuel up with oil and then sail back out. If you've got mines floating around the Persian Gulf, uh, insurance rates will skyrocket and ships will stop sailing the Persian Gulf. And that means Iraq won't have any more money because Saudi Arabia and, and Kuwait were bankrolling its war. And that means the Iraqi government will collapse. Well, the United States was not going to allow that to happen because again, think about what that, that would have meant for the global economy. You know, after the oil shocks of 74 and 78, this was not gonna happen. So the United States, um, first of all, st sent ships to uh, demine the per Persian Gulf, but that wasn't enough because the Iranians were going out every night and sowing more mines. So they actually sent Navy SEALs and American attack helicopters. They were operating off of a barge in the middle in the uh, Persian Gulf 
And they started attacking these, these Iranian ships that were, were laying the mines. I mean, you got American soldiers and sailors attacking Iranian Republican Guard personnel because it was the IRGC that was doing this. It's essentially a shooting war between the United States and Iran, okay? Well, by 1988, that hadn't solved the problem. So President Reagan finally said, we have to end this now. Um, and he gave the authority for Operation Praying Mantis. And there were two, uh, two, two aspects to Praying Mantis. One is that there was a, an abandoned oil rig in the northern Persian Gulf that the Iranians were using to um, site oil tankers as they came in so that they, they could mine more efficiently. American Marines landed, and again, there was a shootout between them and the IRGC. Um, several of the IRGC were killed. Um, they landed, they, they seized the IRGC that, that survived, um, took them prisoner, got everybody off the oil rig, and then blew the thing up. Okay, there you can see it burning in the, that picture. But the other thing is this. President Reagan said, sink the Iranian Navy, all of it. So the, Ameri the, the United States Navy had a couple of aircraft carriers in the Indian Ocean, and they made, immediately targeted the Iranian Navy. And this is a Shahid, um, which was destroyed, sunk, literally sunk, in the process. So the, the praying mantis only lasted one day. But it essentially destroyed the Iranian Navy. And it sent a message to Iran that we were not going to allow you to shut down the Persian Gulf. And then there's Iran Air Flight 665. Now, the USS Vincennes had been sent to the Persian Gulf. And the Vincennes had one of the most modern anti-aircraft systems in the world, okay? capable of shooting down any Soviet aircraft in the world. The problem is that it's like any computer system, it's not perfect. So the Vincennes is, is sailing one, one afternoon, and the radar gets a hit that it identifies as an Iranian F-14, and the radar shows it as on an attack vector on the Vincennes. Now think about this with the USS Stark in mind. The commander of the Vincennes did what any American naval commander would have done. He ordered the aircraft shot down, based on the information he had. That was an Iranian F-14 on a attack vector. It was not. The computer was wrong. It was an Iranian jet carrying Iranians to the Hajj in Mecca. A little over 100 Iranian civilians died. Because like I said, these things are, are designed to take down modern bombers. Taking down a, a, a airliner is nothing to them. So it was deeply embarrassing, but it also made everybody realize that maybe we need to step back here. The Iranians and the United States. It's also the fact that by 1988, the war with Iraq is coming to an end, and Ruhollah Khomeini died. So everybody was kind of at that point thinking, maybe we need to step back from this. Okay? And that really led to, to a, a, a dramatic decline in tensions between the United States and Iran. Now, the other thing that happens is the Soviet withdrawal from Afghanistan. And remember, the Soviet withdrawal from Afghanistan had not been achieved by regular forces fighting the Soviets in a traditional manner, it had been achieved by Afghan rebels, guerrillas, fighting off the, the Soviet Union. So the Iranians were looking at this and thinking, okay, wait a minute, in the event of a, a conflict with the United States, yeah, they've got tanks, they've got bombers, they've got warships, but how do we fight that? Well, Praying Mantis has said, you don't fight that straight up. You have to think of some other way. And that means the IRGC becomes even more important. Because remember, in, in August of 1990, Saddam Hussein occupies Kuwait. The United States deploys very quickly to Saudi Arabia. And then in January of 1991, in 100 hours, the United States throws Iraq out of Kuwait. The Iranians watched that war and were shocked at how fast and how efficiently the United States had taken apart, first of all, the, Iran, the Iraqi economy, and secondly, the Iraqi army. And that convinced them that we're never gonna go up against the United States in a conventional fight. And that means the people we need to turn to are the IRGC, the Islamic Republic Guard Corps. They're the ones who will now operate 
against the Americans. And they'll operate as a, everything from supporting terrorism, training terrorists, for instance, in Lebanon, all the way across to acting as guerrillas should the United States invade Iran. Okay, so this is the Iranian response. And then, and then of course, that also leads us to the missile uh, development of missiles in Iran, because what they want is a, a, the ability to strike at American and Israeli targets out of range of what is left of the Iranian Air Force. Uh, and they especially want to ta target Israeli uh, targets. This also leads to development, uh, uh, the feeling in Iran that they need to develop nuclear weapons because it's not that we want to drop conventional explosives on the United States and damage facilities in the Persian Gulf, say. We want to destroy them utterly. Then in 2003, the United States, and, and again, once again, it just rolls over the Iraqi army. I mean, it, 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 the thing that stopped the United States the most was the sandstorm in the middle of, of the operation. Um, that actually stopped the United States for three days. Um, but the simple fact of the matter is that it, we just took the Iraq, Iraqi army apart. And again, the Iranians were appalled, but they saw an opportunity because an anti-American insurgency emerged very quickly. And they saw, okay, if the Americans are fighting Iraqi insurgents, they're not invading Iran. So they were immediately interested. The IRGC was given the, the uh, mission of training and arming Iraqi insurgents. And they did a very good job of that, okay? And then of course the Iranian nuclear program. Well, the United States has, had been trying to shut this down for uh, years. And now this, be, this becomes even more important to Iran because they want to have that ability to destroy, to, to destroy Israel and also American targets if they can reach them. But again, the question is how do we do that? Well, they're working with the Pakistanis and North Koreans to develop this program and they have protected it very carefully. Uh, the nuclear facilities are very deeply dug, dug in. Um, now, the United States can destroy them, but it's just about only the United States. Now, in 2012, Israel and Saudi Arabia went to the United States and said, look, this Iranian nuclear program has gone too far. You need to destroy it. And the United States refused. So Israel and, and Saudi Arabia started drawing up plans to go with an attack on Iran alone, by themselves. Well... The United States understanding that this was going on, that's the reason why we pushed for a diplomatic solution to the Iranian nuclear program. And that's the reason why we got an agreement from them that they wouldn't pursue nuclear weapons and we would release funds that had been frozen in 1978 uh, when the American hostages had been taken, okay? And it, it was billions of dollars, don't get me wrong, uh, which was a boost to the Iranian economy and, and most of it went to the IRGC but it was a, a last ditch attempt by uh, the United States president to sh at least slow down, if not stop the Iranian nuclear program. But the IRGC is, does not answer to the Iranian government with, with whom we were negotiating. It answers to the mullahs. And they came up with a plan along with Syria to develop a weapons development site in the Syrian desert. And it would be staffed by the IRGC and Syrians and North Korean um, nuclear physicists. It would produce nuclear bombs. The bombs would then be sent to Iran, married to missiles, and we would be stuck with uh, a fait accompli if we ever found out about it. They'd already be there, okay? Uh, the Israelis found out about this. And in 2018, I guess, they launched an air raid um, that destroyed the facility. Now, they had to know, the Americans had to know about this because the Israelis were flying into airspace controlled by the United States, okay? Um, so they had to know about this. And it was called Operation Outside the Box. And then the, the Israeli um, aircraft, on their way back, they flew along the Turkish border and they jettisoned their um, long-range fuel tanks. Now, you didn't really have to do that, but... Israel wanted to send a message to Iran that said, we were here. Now, Israel never came out and talked about it. Syria never came out and talked about it. They just buried the site as soon as possible because it was, in fact, radioactive. 
North Koreans were killed in that, as well as members of the IRGC. Okay, so everybody just kind of acted like it had never happened. Um, but again, it, it, it shows the, the extent to which the IRGC is willing to go to create a nuclear program. And then Kasim Soleimani, uh, head of the IRGC. And he had landed at um, Baghdad, Iraq International Airport. And there had been an attack on, on American forces very recently that had been conducted by the IRGC in, in Iraq, I should add, American forces in Iraq. Uh, so President Trump ordered him killed. The Joint Chiefs of Staff was a, a little bit worried about that because when you start killing foreign leaders, that can rebound back against you, but they carried it out and they killed him, uh, which was a, very much a, a message to the IRGC about what we will do if you continue to harass Americans. And then, of course, in the past few years, Iran has been in turmoil because, look, you've got a generation of Iranians who didn't grow up under the Shah. Um, they grew up under the leadership of governments run by the mullahs, and they don't want to do that. Okay? They want to have a much more open society and a much more um, secular society. Okay? But the other thing is, the Iranian nuclear program is draining the Iraqi economy dry. Nuclear programs are expensive. They want the Iranian nuclear program shut down because that money needs to be spent on Iranians. That's money that needs to be put back in their pockets so that they can buy homes and washing machines and every other damn thing. Um, so Iran has been close to turmoil during much of this time. And again, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps is the organization that's keeping the mullahs in power, not the Iranian police, not the Iranian army. Now, that leads us to this latest prisoner exchange. A couple of Americans had been held in Iran for quite a while, by the way. And the United States still had some funds that they had frozen in 19, I guess, 78 or 79, uh, that they hadn't given back to Iran in the nuclear arms deal. So they kind of deal with Iran, with the Iranian government. Let me rephrase that, with the Iranian government. You release these American captives, we'll release these funds that did belong to the Iran. They just had been frozen for decades. And great. Well, what did that mean? Well, I, I kind of think that from the perspective of the current administration, this was an attempt to make an opening to the Iranian government. Because maybe if we can form links with the Iranian government, if there's enough anti-Mullah sentiment among the Iranian people, we can help them reestablish a secular government separate from the Mullahs. And that's a much better uh, picture for the United States than an Iran run by the Mullahs. Now the problem is this. Okay, yeah, we made an effort to, to come to the Iranians in 85. It didn't do us a damn bit of good. Um, now we've done come to them in 2023. Is it gonna do any good? Well, when I got here, I was sitting in the back and I got out my phone and I, I, I was reading my news. I get my news by electronically these days. And seven hours ago, according, this was according to my news, I, I don't know when exactly it happened, local time, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps had targeted a laser on an American attack helicopter in the Persian Gulf. That could have blinded the pilots and that could have been a disaster. And that is, again, that's a very violent act. So is there an opening for a relationship with Iran? Um, I hate to say this, but I think the answer is that as long as the IRGC exists, the answer is no. I mean, not maybe, not we can work with moderates in the, there are no moderates in the IRGC. The answer quite simply is no. So now that I've depressed y'all after that wonderful music, um, are there any questions? Yeah, I've got one over here. Have we got a mic? By the way, what time is it? I, I kind of went longer than I thought I would. Oh, go ahead and yell. As far as the time frame and the expense of the nuclear program in Iran, are 
Chinese and Russian experts um, doing it quickly, more quickly and less expensively? Aren't they over there helping them? No. China, China and Russia are not helping Iran because North Koreans are much more efficient. And they're much cheaper. North Korea, yeah. The, 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 global, the global nuclear underground was created by a man named A.Q. Khan in, in Pakistan. He developed the Pakistani nuclear weapons program. Uh, but when he was put under house arrest in 2002, um, the, the Kim family took, of Korea took that over. And Kim Jong-un is now head of the North Korean uh, nuclear weapons program. And this is a global program because it's not just bringing uranium into North Korea to make bombs with, it's about bringing specialists to countries that want nuclear weapons and getting them the, the technology, not just the uranium, but all the things that go into making a nuclear bomb um, to develop that bomb. And again, they're, they're actually much cheaper than um, Russia and China. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. What can you tell us about Stuxnet? Oh, yeah. One of my favorites. Yeah, the, the Iranian, um, I, I mean, everything is, is, runs off of computers today. You know, when you start up a, a, a machine, somewhere along the line, even your car, somewhere along, there, along the line, there's a, a chip or a mini computer that runs that car, okay? Um, and manufacturing nuclear weapons is no different. When you've got a centrifuge, you have to take uranium and run it through a centrifuge so that the uranium is, is all packed into one piece. So it's, it, it, there are no other metals in that. Uh, and what Sexta had done, it was a, a computer virus that either Israel or the CIA had written, or probably together. I would, I would not doubt that they wrote this together. And the idea was they got it into the Iranian... Um, nuclear weapon system, it was just a, a, a virus that moved like any other computer virus. You open up the wrong email attachment, congratulations, it's in your, in your computer. And now when you send it to somebody else, it's going to them, and just like any other virus. And what Stuxnet did was it got into, ultimately managed to make its way into the Iranian nuclear um, weapon system, the uh, centrifuges, and it shut down the controls on the centrifuges so that when they started running them up, you, you can't run them too fast, otherwise they'll, they'll fall apart. They'll break up and explode. Well, without that, that um, hold on it, they didn't actually, the centrifuges did break up and explode. Uh, and that set the, the Iranian nuclear program back uh, by several years. Because again, now they had to go out and get new centrifuges. They had to clear their system of the Stuxnet virus. Um, they had to get the uranium that they had lost as a result of this. Um, so it did a very good job of slowing down, slowing down the um, Iranian nuclear weapon system, but certainly not stopping it. I would also add, now that you bring up Stuxnet, um, Israel has had a, an ongoing campaign to assassinate Iranian nuclear scientists who are working on the um, nuclear weapons program. Um, you identify, if they can identify a person who is particularly important in that program, uh, he is going to get killed in some way, shape, or form. Uh, so, yeah, Israel at a bare minimum has a, a very real interest in seeing to it that Iran does not get nuclear weapons. And they're going to do it no matter how brutal they have to be. And the, uh, the Iranian people, yeah. do they know what's going on with their government and what's happening? Are they, are they behind their, their government? I think they do because remember, in this electronic age, we have access to all kinds of information from outside of our realm. Um, I mean, you can get Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, Radio Middle East um, on your phone these days. Um, and yes, they, they are hearing these things. The problem is the mechanisms for the Iranian people to stop this don't exist. Because remember, the, the Iranian people elect a government, but the, the people in that government have to be chosen by the mullahs. You can only run for government if you're chosen by a mullah. Okay, so great. Um, we can't go to the government to get this changed, and it's also a program that is not run by the government. It's run by the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. So even if we, we went to the government and said, stop this program, the government would say, it, it ain't, the money ain't going through our, our banks. 
Yeah, so I, I think that they, they know, uh, the pro and that, again, that's one of the reasons why we're seeing so much unrest in Iran, mm -hmm. is that they're looking at this program and saying, wait a minute, we're in dire economic straits and you're spending money on what? Yeah, yeah. During your talk, you talked about energy and oil yeah. and the world economy. Yeah. Well, right now, I guess we have a lot of oil reserves, but we're not producing oil. Our reserves are depleted because of the situation in Iran. Yeah. Not Iran, but uh, uh, hot, you know, anyway. But what do you think that is going to happen with our country now? Right? When our gas is $7 a gallon, we're not producing oil, and we're dependent on Saudi Arabia, and they're getting closed, closed to Russia now. Well, yeah, that, I mean, that's a problem. It really goes back to 2012 or 13. Look, in, in 2012, uh, the United States uh, military went to, to Barack Obama and said, look, we have a problem in the Pacific, period. Okay, We now have a peer military threat in China. Not a near peer, but one that is capable of fighting us and winning. And that means that we have to pivot to the Pacific and that modern aircraft, modern warships, the organization of the army and modern weapons, that has to be organized towards a war against China in the Pacific. The problem is that we had spent, by that time, almost 15 years fighting in the Persian Gulf and basically fighting insurgencies. We, we just weren't prepared for that shift. So two things had to happen. We can't fight a war in both the Middle East and the Pacific. We can't afford it. I mean, if you think that the federal deficit is bad now, wait until you try to build a couple aircraft carriers to replace what we send to the Middle East from the Pacific to fight China. I mean, it's just a disaster. So the American presence in, in the Middle East had to be drawn down dramatically. And the shift of the, our emphasis to the Pacific well, that's a problem because in 1981, Ronald Reagan had cut a deal with Saudi Arabia in which Saudi Arabia would act as the um, swing producer in oil. When oil prices got too low, and remember, Texas, Oklahoma, a lot of oil is produced there, so you don't want oil prices to get too low, otherwise workers will be thrown out of their, their jobs. Saudi Arabia would cut back so that oil prices would come up. And when oil prices got too high, Saudi Arabia would flood the, the system with oil to make them come back down. And the, the quid pro quo for that was we agreed to defend Saudi Arabia. That's the reason for the 91 Gulf War. Um, the, the, the massive air, air base infrastructure, the port of Dahran that allowed us to bring troops in by sea, that was all built by the United States and Saudi Arabia um, to, with this, this swing system in mind. The problem is that in 2012, when we tell Saudi Arabia, we have to withdraw from the Middle East for all intents and purposes, they're furious. Who is going to defend us? So t the Saudis ultimately did two things. One, and, and again, the fact that the United States refused to attack Iran and destroy the Iranian nuclear program did not help this either. Okay? So what happened was the Saudis gave up the swing role and now they're, they're just cutting back so that prices will go high. Now, um, they're also working now with China and Russia because they don't see the United States as a reliable ally anymore. Okay? Now, when you combine that, Saudi Arabia no longer playing the swing role with Venezuelan um, chaos affecting the Venezuelan oil production, uh, you've also got a, a uh, Al Qaeda in the Maghreb, which is threatening Nigerian oil. I mean, and, and that's bringing a significant chunk of Nigerian oil off the market. We've had, we've embargoed Russian oil because of the invasion of Ukraine, um, and Iraq has still not gotten up to its pre-war levels in terms of oil production. The end result is that you've got just you no longer have a, a secure oil industry. Um, and it's going to go through these weird fluctuations. And because there's, there's so little on the market, prices are going up. And as I see it, there's not much we can do about that. Because again, unless we're going to cut a deal with Saudi Arabia to go back to that swing role, um, which I don't see happening, 
I think that, that bridge has been burned. Uh, we're just gonna get stuck with higher oil prices. And again, that has very real economic impacts all the way across the economy, just like in 73. Um, we drive to work, we, we bring in our, our food from the Midwest, that's all gonna lead to inflation. Yeah, so it, it's, it's not, I think, a, a simple ball of wax to, to, that we can get to the center of very, very easily. Um, I think it's a much more complex problem um, that we are confronting. Did that answer the question? Thank you very much. Or did that, did that just depress you guys? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you.